Hey, what's up? Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for checking out my videos. These are the IT Dojo Security Plus questions of the day. I'm Colin Weaver. Every single day I come at you with two brand new questions to help you as you study for your Security Plus exam. So let's jump right in it. All right, here's your question. Ants, let's break it down. You have recently discovered that your 802.11 wireless LAN is RF visible several floors above your current office location. And that's not right. So my question to you is, is which of these items could you employ in order to go in and reduce your RF cell size, to reduce the area of coverage, keeping in mind that making sure that you still provide adequate coverage where you need it is going to be something that you have to do. So give those answer choices some contemplation. When you're ready, click on play again and we can talk it through. All right, your first consideration here says configure PEEP or protected EAP. Uh, configuring protected EAP is going to make your wireless LAN more secure, uh, assuming that you're not using something that's stronger than that already. Um, but uh, it's not going to do anything to, in terms of your RF cell size. So no, configuring protected EAP is not going to help you as far as cell sizing. Choice number two says, why don't you move the access point to the center of the office? Um, in this particular scenario, your issues are more vertical than they are horizontal. So moving your access point to the center of the office is highly unlikely to actually be your solution. Now, it's not the right answer here, but I'm not going to just full on outright discount it. But remember, from an exam perspective, it's all about choosing the best answers, not necessarily the only plausible answers. But uh, something as seemingly simple as just moving it to the center of the room isn't going to solve your vertical RF coverage problems. So I wouldn't consider that to be an appropriate choice. Your next answer choice on the list says that you should reconsider the type of antenna that you're using as well as the placement of the antennas. This is absolutely one of the ways that you can go in and control your RF coverage areas. Uh, depending upon the type of antenna that you use, an omnidirectional antenna, uh, a semi-directional or a highly directional antenna, and the, the polarization of that antenna in terms of its physical orientation is going to have a lot of impact on the propagation patterns of your RF energy. So you're going to want to go in and uh, give some thought to that of where these antennas should be and what type of antenna they should be in order to make sure that you are pushing your radio energy as much as is possible uh, given the particular technology that you're using as far as 802.11 uh, towards where your actual user base is and not as much as possible to places like upstairs and downstairs where users are that aren't going to need to benefit from your wireless LAN coverage. The next item says, why don't you move to a different channel? Uh, no. Now, if you're in the 2.4 gigahertz frequency range or in the 5 gigahertz frequency range, the channel that you're on is really going to be more um, associated with how much other interference there is, particularly if you're in a multi-tenant office building. There's going to be a lot of competing sources of radio energy that you have to contend with, and changing channels can be one of the things that can help you go in and reduce the amount of interference from other competing sources of RF. It is not, however, going to really do much as far as controlling what your RF propagation pattern is. So uh, switching to a different channel is not the right answer here either. All right, how about moving from so-called fat APs to thin APs? Uh, fat APs, if you're not familiar with that term, is an access point that has a lot of logic and stuff built into it, whereas thin APs are really just kind of radios that tunnel their traffic back to a wireless LAN controller somewhere deeper in the belly of your network. Um, in neither of these cases does the access point being fat or thin have much to do with the actual propagation pattern of your radio energy. It has to do with where the connections are maintained and managed. So no, uh, using fat, thin, or even uh, fit APs aren't really going to go in and provide you much uh, help as far as your coverage patterns are concerned. And then the last answer choice, which is actually one of the correct answer choices, is for you to go in and reduce the power being produced by your access point. You know, the sum total of what your propagation pattern is, is, is controlled by two, more than two things, but the, the two big things that are really heavy components of this are how much power your access point is producing and the type and orientation of the antennas that you have connected to that access point. 
Um, those two things, more so than anything else, are going to go in and provide a big impact on the propagation of your radio energy. Now, newer technologies get into all kinds of fancy stuff with beam forming and varying amounts of transmit power based upon how many spatial streams and all kinds of other stuff that you have. All that's beyond the scope of this question. I'm trying to stick with you know, fairly basic concepts in terms of uh, making sure that your RF cell size is, is appropriately uh, scoped or sized. And two of the single biggest factors associated with that are antenna choice and antenna placement, as well as the amount of power produced by your access point. All right, let's look at question number two. Question number two says that you've got a network where you've got 11, I need an extra finger, uh, 11 VLANs and six physical switches. And not all of your users are all centrally located. And what I mean by that is that all the users who need to be in a particular VLAN aren't going to be plugged into one particular switch. They're going to be spread out across all the different switches. Now, you need to allow for intra VLAN communication and inter VLAN routing. So you need to have connectivity for the nodes who are um, all in the same VLAN, intra VLAN. And you also need to be able to communicate between the VLANs, inter VLAN. So given this big long list of choices right here, which of them need to be done or need to be in place in order for you to be able to have both inter and intra VLAN communication? Of, of these choices that are there, I want you to pick three for me. So go ahead and click on pause, give those some thought, and then we can break them down and look at uh, what the right answers are. All right, your first answer choice says that you should configure a layer two switch to do inter VLAN routing. Uh, no, layer two switches deal exclusively with MAC addresses and therefore cannot route between VLANs. So a layer two switch isn't going to accomplish that. Next choice says that you should route all the traffic through the native VLAN. Uh, that's just some made up junk that I put in there just to try and confuse you if you really weren't sure what the answers were. Um, the statement just does not make any sense to go in and do that. So you can't route traffic through the native VLAN to get to all the other VLANs. It's not the way it works. All right, how about the third choice? Configure STP, the spanning tree protocol, in order to tag the traffic on your switch to switch links. Man, that sounds compelling, except the spanning tree has nothing to do with the tagging of data. The spanning tree is a protocol that's all about loop avoidance and a redundant switching topology. It does not do anything as far as tagging your different VLAN traffic. So no, that is not the right answer. All right, now we're getting somewhere. How about you configure a layer three switch to route the traffic between the VLANs? Yes, that will solve objective number, I guess two, looking at the question, which was that you needed to have inter VLAN uh, communication or inter VLAN routing and a layer three switch has the capacity to actually route traffic between the different VLANs and so that would accomplish that objective for you. Next answer choice says that you need to allocate a unique IP subnet to each one of the virtual LANs. This is absolutely true. Even though VLANs are very much a layer two construct, they map to IP subnets. And so every single one of your 11 VLANs is gonna be a, a unique subnet. It's gonna have a unique subnet ID. And then all of those nodes that you're gonna place on these different VLANs will all have a host address that is uh, unique to that particular network that you've created. So yes, you're gonna to need to create unique subnets for each one. All right, next to the last choice, configure 802.1Q on each of the ports that's connected to one of your PCs or servers? No, uh, the, the last answer is what you wanna do. 802.1Q is a tagging or trunking protocol. And what 802.1Q does is it labels the VLAN from which this traffic came as it goes from one switch to another switch, or from that switch to switch link or that trunk link, that's where 802.1Q works. You would not want to run 802.1Q on ports that just have PCs and servers connected to them. Now, there are some caveats to that with servers if you're doing trunking to your servers, uh, but I'm not getting that deep into this in this particular situation. So you're gonna be able to have intra VLAN communication. So say somebody on VLAN five wants to communicate with somebody else on VLAN five between two switches because the traffic's going to be tagged using 802.1Q as it travels from switch one over to switch two, labeled as belonging to VLAN five. And then the layer three functionality of your layer three switch is gonna go in and give you the capacity to route between the VLANs. And so routing from VLAN five over to VLAN six, and that's all gonna work because you've gone in and created unique subnet IDs for each one of those individual networks that's going to allow for each of those networks to be uniquely identified from a layer three perspective, a logical perspective, and then each of those nodes to have a unique host identifier on their respective networks. So that's a lot. I know that required you to know quite a few different things in there, uh, but hopefully that helped you um, as you were continuing for your studies to, to go in and do that.
All right, just like that, two more questions done. I appreciate you watching. Click like if you like these questions. If you have any other questions about any of this kind of stuff, throw it down in the comments below. I respond to all the comments that I get. So um, I appreciate you being here. I'll be back tomorrow. I'll see you then.